you can see the history of humankind on a simple time chart. There are some wonderful, very clever charts that might be called a timeline of human history, or of religious beliefs, or perhaps of Bible history. Some have powerful connectivity to just about everything you would like to know. Very creative, very colorful diagrams that can be helpful. I could never create such impressive charts, and yet other than being knowledge-packed and interesting walk-arounds, they seldom, if ever, are providing you with what you need. That is, you need the truth. The truth about life, about the history of life. Of course, they are not meant to provide the truth of these things, just information, like names, dates, and places. If well done meaning simple, easily understood, reasonably accurate, one might be able to see something behind the timeline. More than chance. A sensible, rational timeline might suggest something more than randomness like a plan, and consequently a planner. The most valuable timelines are created with a good understanding of the message from God. Such a timeline can be more meaningful even have a spiritual aspect, and that is what has been done in this video. Thus, with the goal of trying to help people succeed, that is share in the divine nature, several charts were developed. Indeed, the timeline is more than events, dates, places, and people, but is God's plan revealed to this point in time? God had in mind certain things in the big picture of life, but there was an uncontrolled force, namely humankind's free will. Thus, the timeline represents the outcome of God's plan and humankind's choices to this point in time. The first timeline is the timeline for the existence of humankind from creation to the last day. Next, timeline for Jesus' life and building his church. Then, timeline for losing the gospel message. Finally, there is a timeline diagram that answers the question. What happens when you die? These timelines are likely not what might be expected, but they are what you need. God made everything very simple, but humankind in a great deal of stubbornness often does not focus on that which is most important. This is a high-level timeline for life. It includes everything for every person. I apologize if it is too hard to read. However, on a full-size computer screen it should be fine. I wanted to have everything on a single page from time zero to the end of the world. To date that will be over 6,000 years, but we do not know how much longer until the end. Some people might scoff at 6,000 years, but it is very possible and quite likely. This is explained in various books and videos by the author. The extremely short version of this is that it would not be a problem for God. When we consider that God created everything with some apparent age, it becomes rather logical that everything could be much, much younger, as mentioned, likely. People often hide behind dating methods thinking they are infallible, whereas God is infinitely superior to humankind in every way. He can think everything into existence, and those things can appear as any age. The entirety of the physical universe could be created in a mere second, yet appear to be very old. No, God is not trying to fool anyone but wants every person to succeed. The things humankind think are important, such as the details of creation, are not important. The soul is important. The science of humankind is indeed primitive, after all the physical nature of everything, and time are God's creation for the test. Another thing is the date of Jesus' birth. I have seen various scholars indicate Jesus was born either at 3, 4, or 5 AD and not 0 AD. That might be interesting, but not of any value. So I am assigning Jesus' birth to be 0 AD. It does not matter for this analysis, or does it matter for any reason. God indicates he can be seen in what is made. Romans 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The evidence for God being the God of the Bible is only found in the Scriptures. Someone might think that is cheating, but actually it is very logical. We see the wisdom of God, we see the beginning, and a planned finale, a structure to achieve a purpose, 
a plan that defines everything in terms any person can understand. We learn who we are and why we exist, and it is easy to see God's perfection in His design. Let us continue to discuss this timeline. The timeline shows 7,000 years. Currently we are at about 6,024 years, and the 7,000 is there because that is all the room available to be reasonably readable in 250-year segments. No one knows the timing for the last day, not even the sun. There are three sections of the timeline that contain critical events. First, the days of creation with three events mentioned. Then the time called year zero, the birth of Jesus with five events mentioned. And finally, to the far right, where all the events mentioned occur in one day. Let us begin with the events at the beginning on the far left. The first event is the creation consisting of seven days. Then shortly thereafter, sin enters the world with Adam and Eve's disobedience. Immediately following is God's promise to reconcile sinners back to Him. However, this would not be understood for another 4,000 years. Now, the period between the creation and when Jesus is on earth is about 4,000 years. I have left this time relatively blank. Certainly this part of the timeline could be filled with hundreds of important events. I selected five events between 2344 BC and 701 BC that provide some relationship between important events. The first two events are well-known judgments of God and quite severe. First is the flood in the days of Noah, and the second is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The next event shown occurred in 1849 BC, and is the promise made to Abraham regarding how all nations would be blessed in his seed. This is a complementary promise to the one in Genesis 3.15 as it accomplishes the same thing as a result of the seed of woman. However, it clarifies inasmuch as the promise applies to all men and not just the children of Israel, that is, all nations will be blessed. Next, I placed Moses leading Israel out of captivity in its appropriate place in 1446 BC just for reference. Finally, Isaiah was a prophet between 740 and 701 BC and told of the Messiah in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So from the beginning when God made the promise in relation to addressing the sin problem, he was foretelling the Messiah, as was Isaiah. Isaiah is one of many who provided prophecies of Jesus during this period. The next section of events occur over a 100-year period beginning with the birth of Jesus. They are discussed on the next screen. The final group of events all occur in one day namely the last day. This day begins with Jesus returning in the air. This is followed by taking certain persons to ever be with the Lord, then the destruction of all things, and lastly the final judgment. The emphasis of this video is not to provide detailed timeline information, since that would have only limited value. It is to provide the truth about the time people spend in the body. Humankind goes back about 6,024 years at this point, and maybe there have been 100 billion persons who existed. Actually, very few people would argue that this number is in the range believed by those who have studied such things. Again, it does not matter, but it is a big number. Jesus is born, and at about age 30 he begins teaching publicly, and it is in relation to the coming kingdom. Then in 33 AD, he is murdered at the bequest of the Jews. He dies on the cross, is buried, and on the third day he rises from the dead. God's promise of Genesis 3.15 has been fulfilled. Actually, all six events mentioned on this timeline occurred in the first 100 years after the birth of Jesus. Each one is exceedingly significant. As promised, the Holy Spirit comes to the apostles and guides them into all truth. Then the gospel message is preached, and those obedient to that message 
are reconciled to God. Jesus begins to build his church. It is the body of Christ, a spiritual church. Jesus, in obedience to the Father, fulfilled the promise, and now the reason for the promise is realized as people are actually reconciled to God. In 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed as Jesus had indicated to the apostles. It is the third judgment of God mentioned in the overall timeline, and of course, perfectly consistent with the description given by Jesus. Somewhere near the end of the first century, miracles cease. The Holy Spirit had worked with the apostles from about 33 AD until near the end of the first century. He was confirming the word that was being delivered in miraculous ways. Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will? So, as the first century is winding down, we see that as predicted in 1 Corinthians 13, the miraculous things of God will end. Also, as mentioned in the same chapter, God's communication with humankind is being completed. It is referred to as that which is perfect. Humankind will always prefer miraculous things, but upon close examination, those things have not brought longevity of respect for God. However, the completed word of God for those who love God can provide permanence in its perfection. I have not included any events after the first 100 years of this period, because in a very real sense, there is little of spiritual significance. There is one spiritual event that is repeated over this period of roughly 2,000 years, and it is Jesus adding the obedient to his kingdom, the spiritual body of Christ, his spiritual church. Also, there is one remaining miracle and it occurs just as the last age ends. It is the last day, but the timing is unknown. This day is filled with supernatural activity. Jesus returns in the air. He takes those first from the graves, i.e. in paradise, then those alive in Christ to ever be with the Lord. Then the world and the things therein are destroyed. Really all things physical will be gone as well as the works therein. Next, the final judgment and each person on this last day will be eternally fixed in the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death, or they will be eternally with God the Father and the Son in the new heaven and new earth. Now, there is another timeline that is important to every living person to understand if they want to be successful. There is incredible deceit in the world driven by selfish, greedy, careless, and naive persons that can damage the truth you need. The timeline has the gospel message preached for the first time in Acts 2 in 33 AD. Jesus, in obedience to the Father, has now opened the way for each person to be reconciled to the Father. It will be in obedience to the gospel, that is to the death, burial, and resurrection of God's Son. We are off to a great start, but it will not be long before Jesus' warning is realized. Namely, beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. The danger is always spiritual. False teaching, that is, lies. The one thing at risk is the gospel message. It is needed for salvation. It represents the truth in terms of having sins forgiven and symbolizes the importance of the truth from God. Paul gives the first indication of the gospel being changed in Galatians in about 50 AD. Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ, to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. It is possible to provide considerable detail regarding how the gospel message was lost. This author wrote a book called God, Catholic Audacity, The Origin of the Catholic Church and the Loss of the Gospel Message. 
It is the true history of Catholicism, and really the history of Christianity. In a sense, the history of Christianity is rather invisible, as Catholicism became known as Christianity. The timeline on this page at a high level describes how this happened. Instead of the Word of God being respected, carefully handled, there is belligerence as humankind casually and continuously changes the Word of God. The tragedy is that neither in Catholicism or in Protestantism is there any salvation. You can read how the Gospel message was lost in the book mentioned, but not surprisingly it has to do with various people in pride seeking what they want. There is great power in claiming you represent God, and many people sought such honor. Let us continue with this timeline of how the gospel message was lost. We begin with Paul, indicating some were already changing the gospel message even as it was being delivered. In the early centuries, certain learned individuals became known as the early fathers of the church. Although greatly respected, they were not inspired, but were privately interpreting the scriptures. It seemed they had the best of intentions, but they did not understand the seriousness of making changes to what God delivered. God strongly condemns changing His Word and refers to it as privately interpreting the Scriptures. 2 Peter 1 verses 20 and 21 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This was the beginning of liberalism, of having a casual attitude in handling God's word that has never ended. The gospel message was changed, and the church both spiritual and local were much different than that delivered to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. Certainly there was no connectivity with God. The church of the first two centuries being largely aligned with the truth were going through horrific persecutions. In the early 4th century, as a result of the Edicts of Toleration and of Milan, Christianity was being accepted by Rome. Although the Edicts were a good thing, the Christians in their weakened and confused doctrinal state, due partially to disputes involving the early Church Fathers, were now being integrated with the many Roman idols. Consequently, they were losing their character, and by now the Gospel message was effectively lost. Emperor Constantine discovered that there was considerable doctrinal turmoil in Christianity, similar to the fighting among the pagan gods of Rome. Constantine wanted this resolved and caused the first church council in 325 in Nicaea. This call to resolving the disagreements, or we might say to reach a consensus of beliefs, is the opposite of God's defined local church. Each local church was independent, with the only rule book being the Word of God. Over history to this date, there have been 21 different councils, we might say 21 rule-making councils. Men making the rules for God and the result was something diametrically opposed to the Word of God. During this time, there was a growing fervor to have a single head over the church. Those discussions go back to the early 4th century, but by the 6th century it was near, and we have some individuals claiming such authority. Finally, in the early 7th century there is a single person named and referred to as the Pope, and the Church had a new name, that is the Roman Catholic Church. This Church had no resemblance to the 1st century Church. This new Church was one of paranoia that used violence to cover the authority they were missing. Throughout this turmoil, there has always been a few following the doctrine of Christ. Unfortunately, any differentiation from the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church was met with the severest of penalties, meaning torture and murder, frequently burning at the stake. Finally, by the 16th century, there was a movement against the Catholic evil that was sustained. It was the Protestant movement led by people like Martin Luther and John Calvin. Their movement immediately resulted in a new Catholic Inquisition targeted to destroy the Protestant heretics. This time the opposition to the Catholic Church would win out over the violence from Rome and most nations loyal to Rome would end their support in terms of hunting down and murdering Rome's heretics. Unfortunately, these Catholic priests like Luther, Calvin, and others never understood that the Catholic Church was not the Church of the first century. The Catholic Church, since its beginning in the early 7th century, using its massive resources, 
and with help from the early Church Fathers' writings, work to create evidence of a first-century association. Thus, instead of restoring the first-century Church, they reformed the Catholic Church, keeping many aspects of Catholicism. They also developed a new gospel message, but like Catholicism, it was different than the one of the first century. Today, these so-called Christian churches of the world have no association with God. There is no salvation in either Catholicism or Protestantism. This timeline called Losing the Gospel Message represents a history that is typically unknown. Few understand the God-inspired truth of the first century. The spiritual church, God's answer to reconciliation, has been replaced by humankind's physical churches. This awareness is critically important to understand what happened to the church Jesus was building, and consequently understand why we have all these varied gospel messages in the world. This visual may seem like a departure from the previous timelines, but it is just another timeline, but without dates. Learning about people, events and the timing of such things has value. But in our short lives we need the truth. If the material is not helping you to be successful, then something needs to change. This timeline shows the big picture of life and is very direct and certainly something every person ought to understand. The chart makes it very simple because indeed the truth regarding what happens when you die is simple. However, living in a way to succeed can be very challenging. I have presented this subject in various discussions, videos, and books because it is a frequent question where people sincerely seek an answer. Perhaps the one thing where there is nearly 100% agreement is that death follows life. Any more detail usually finds serious disagreement. However, like in all things there is truth and there is error. In any case, your eternity is determined by what you did when you were alive in the body. Well, you may say, no, not true because each person goes out of existence at death. That is not fact, not even close, but for many it is wishful thinking. I am not sure why, but people are often concerned that a failed life might lead to punishment. Thus, it is better to think, to hope, that death means going out of existence. It is obvious if you continue to exist, you must exist somewhere. In fact, there is a place, and it is called Hades. It is the holding place, and not much is revealed, but enough to know it is real, and that at the instant of death, each person will find themselves in Hades. As the visual indicates, dying in sin places you in a location of torment. You lived your life on the broad road which many travel. You want to live on the narrow road, and it is narrow because it is God's way and not your way. But His way can be your way. Indeed, few follow that path. If you look around and consider God's definition of sin, it will make perfect sense that not many will align with what God requires. Few will follow His way. Even those who do must stay on that path throughout their lives. Be faithful until death. You will learn that God's expectations are high as He left the gospel message in the hands of those in the body of Christ, His spiritual church. Once you arrive in Hades either in the place of comfort or the place of torment, your fate is known, but your final existence will not be in Hades. You are held in Hades until the last day. You are missing the details of your judgment, but that will be revealed on the last day. Christ returns in the air and takes those in his spiritual body, first those in their graves, actually in paradise, and then those alive at his return to always be with the Lord. All things physical will be destroyed, and then the final judgment. The final judgment is more of a sentencing since your fate was sealed when you died. No changing that. Those in Hades in torment will transfer to the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death. Those in paradise will be headed for the new heaven and new earth to spend eternity with God the Father and the Son. Each person who fails will experience the most severe regret for the pride that did not allow them to follow God's way, but it had to be their way. Indeed, it is serious stuff, and the words of Paul will ring true, namely, 
Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. This is the end of part one. Please continue with part two. Available at the same location as part one. These are the author's books relative to this subject. They are designed to support this and other videos, all with the common goal of helping people to have a successful life, ending in sharing in the divine nature.